Hi, I'm Gavin Givanoni, Professor of Neurology from Bart's and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry, and I'm going to talk to you about the case for using autologous hemopoietic stem cell transplant in treatment to naive patients. So this is a presentation I gave uh, on Friday the 20th of January to the International Symposium that was held in Sheffield. Point out that I have a large number of disclosures, uh, simply because I do a lot of uh, uh, treatment trials uh, as a way of improving MS outcomes. So I think the benefits, I think most people would argue that there's enough data out there to suggest that uh, autologous hemopoietic stem cell transplant uh, is the most effective MS disease modifying therapy. And yeah, we have two meta-analyses, one from uh, uh, Maria Pia Samani's group and one from Paolo Mararo, uh, published just showing you that when you look at NIDA, no evident disease activity, uh, HACT is superior even with uh, follow-up compared to our other existing disease modifying treatments. And yeah, we have the NIDA rates um, uh, across our treatment trials versus HACT, and you can see HACT is uh, the most effective treatment in terms of rendering people free of disease activity. And this is, means no relapses uh, or no MRI activity or no disability progression. <clears throat> now, in another meta-analysis by um, uh, uh, Paolo Mararo, he shows that even uh, HACT is not ideal, it's not perfect because you know over time people will uh, worsen. So yeah, we can see in the top right hand the total cohort, and this is the pr proportion. Uh, this is a, what we call a survival curve, and these are the people with uh, disease progression. And you can see when you start getting out towards 10 years, okay, 60% um, of people will get worse despite having uh, HACT. In other words, HACT is not getting to the underlying core problem of trying to uh, stop disease worsening. I've discussed this as being smoldering MS. Yes, HACT is very good at switching off MRI and uh, activity and relapses, but it, it's not ideal in terms of stopping some of the processes that drive uh, um, smoldering uh, MS. I think what's important is that age uh, uh, plays a role. So you can see uh, in this particular graph, young people do better than older people. And so this is another indication for thinking about using this treatment earlier than later is because if you want to make a, have a benefit, you want to get onto this uh, sooner than later. And similarly, people with early relapsing MS do better than people with more advanced or progressive MS, be it secondary or primary progressive. So I think the uh, message coming out of the meta-analysis of all the HSE trials is age and uh, type of disease make a difference in terms of predicting it. I also want to point out that not all HACT is equivalent, and so this uh, graph on the right here just shows you that some treatments are more myeloablative, in other words, much more aggressive than others. Um, <clears throat> so you just got to be aware that even within the HACT literature, there are more effective forms of HACT and less effective based on the degree of ablation. I personally think we need to go beyond thinking about MS as being an inflammatory relapses MRI activity and need to focus on brain volume loss. And you may or may not know that people with MS, their brain shrink uh, at a rate that's two to seven times what a normal person would shrink. And this is a picture of somebody with a healthy adult here, 31-year-old male, and, and those black areas are the ventricles. And you can see they go from nice small ventricles, and this is somebody with early relapsing disease. They're larger, and then people with more advanced, they're even larger. So you can see the degree of brain volume loss. And brain volume loss is kind of the integrator of damage, and those with the most damage do worse, not only in terms of cognition, but in terms of quality of life and outcomes in terms of disability. So if you have MS, you want to have a therapy that protects your brain volume. And there is no... Uh, better data than uh, HACT in terms of protecting brain volume. So this is actually the Canadian uh, uh, trial in Ottawa, where they actually use the most myeloid ablative of all the HACTs. And you can see these little red triangles are all their attacks. And then the post-treatment, um, uh, uh, you can see most patients are rendered free of activity. 
these little stars are patients that unfortunately died. As you know, uh, and you, so this is just an example of why these treatments are not that good. No, sorry, the not not the stars, the little um, the, uh, cross here is the person who passed uh, passed away from complications of the therapy. On the, on, the, on the right here, it just shows you the brain volume. So this is zero brain volume change. And you can see within the first six months, there is quite a dramatic drop in brain volume. This is likely to be due to the neurotoxicity, the effect of the actual chemotherapy used to do the myeloablation, the blatant bone marrow, uh, being toxic to the nervous system. But then after you recover from that, the brain volume loss is almost close to zero. Uh, but at a, at a level that's way below 1% per annum, and that's kind of what you'd expect in normal people. Um, unfortunately, age is a neurodegenerative disease. So from about 35 years of age, we all start losing brain volume. And it does accelerate with age. But people, uh, normal people lose a small uh, proportion of their brains every year. And that kind of correlates with, uh, you know, why we uh, our brains don't work as well when we get older because, you know, there is this degeneration going in the background in normal people. But I think the message I want to get across here is in this particular uh, trial, HSE-T is normalizing your brain volume loss. And because this is such an important outcome measure, you've got to ask yourself the question, if I had MS, wouldn't you want a therapy that normalizes your brain volume? There's one other treatment that does this, and that's alumtuzumab. Uh, the trade name is Lemtrada, and this is actually the eight-year follow-up of the phase three trial cohorts. There were two trials, those with patients with Naive, which was a Care MS-1. They had never had any other treatment, and then the Care MS-2 people had come onto the trial after having failed, uh, having been failed by interferon or beta or glutaromacetate. But I want to point out that in the blue year is the brain volume loss in people on alemtuzumab, uh, the blackest people that were on interferon in the first two years of the trial, and then you know, the interferon, you continue to lose quite a lot of brain volume. Um, but the important point is the younger you are, the, the, uh, the less brain volume you use. But the important thing is all these brain volume uh, measurements, which is around 0.15% per annum or lower, is kind of what you'd expect for a normal age match control population. So this is the uh, second. Uh, treatment, the best treatment in terms of normalizing brain volume loss. Now, uh, what people and your consultants and people don't tell you is that none of the other treatments okay, get close to this. Uh, and I think that's because, yes, the other treatments are pretty effective at switching off relapse MRI activity. They were not getting to the disease process uh, as well. Now, we all know what the risks are, um, and this is a, uh, a, a recent cohort published from the London group, and there clearly is a lot of complications associated with the procedure, and I think that's what's important to realize is that when you ablate your uh, bone marrow function, and wait for it to recover after you had the stem cells, you are at risk of getting infections and the complications associated with having uh, low white cell counts, low platelets, etc., and there is a mortality. So in the uh, London cohort, which is uh, uh, just over 100 patients, uh, the, the mortality was 2.5%. There were three deaths. Okay, And most uh, bone marrow transplant units are running between 0.3% and 2% mortality. So you've got to realize that this procedure is not for the faint-hearted. And then other issues that arise is infertility risk. Because you're having hydrocyclophosphamide, you may be left, if you're a woman with uh, ovarian toxicity, you go into early menopause. So if you want to have children, you've got to harvest your eggs and store, and a male has to put his sperm in a bank. This takes time. Obviously, chemotherapy-induced neurotoxicity is an issue, particularly in older patients, and that's why we don't like older patients with MS to go for this procedure because they're more susceptible to the complications. There is a risk of secondary malignancy over time. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's going to be much higher than background. Uh, based on other cohorts, other diseases, it's likely to be at uh, two to three times higher than the background rate. Uh, you also get a secondary autoimmunity risk. So we know with alemtuzumab, uh, you know, about 40 to 45% of people will develop a second autoimmune disease. These are usually antibody mediated. They're usually manageable. Uh, we think the risk with uh, HACT is about a third of that, so it will be in the region of about 15% of patients. 
will develop a second autoimmune disease. The most common one is autoimmune thyroid disease. And then obviously with uh, HACT, you've got to take time off work. Uh, most units tell their patients to prepare to be off work for six months. And that's a problem if you have to work. <clears throat> Um, we also revaccinate. Some people don't like that. Uh, and then there's also adverse events from the so-called concomitant medications we use. And just to say to you that uh, uh, I'm aware of one patient who uh, was on a drug called cotrimoxazole. That's just to prevent them getting chest infections uh, after HACT, and they developed severe liver failure as a complication of the medication used to prevent infections. So there is a lot of uh, risks associated with this, but you have to be aware of. Um, just to say to you that in general, people who have HACT, the risk is all front loaded uh, and the immune system eventually does recover, so you're not left with chronic uh, immunosuppression. And in general, it's a one off treatment. Most people don't have a second one. Uh, there have been reports of people with multiple sclerosis having second and even a third um, uh, transplant, but it's generally a one-off treatment. So that's also another plus side. And I think the fact that it's a one-off treatment makes it quite cost-effective when you look at the cost of these uh, compared to having disease-modifying therapies continuously. Has it been used first line? <clears throat> and I think yes. So the, I mean, there's been a rapid uptake, uh, and this just shows you um, the European uh, data. There's been this massive increase in the use of um, uh, HACT for autoimmune diseases, and it's dominated by multiple sclerosis, believe it or not. You can see uh, in 2018, you know, more than half the cases were for MS. But really exciting, it's been driven by a few countries, um, and the United Kingdom is just behind Italy in terms of its use. Then Germany, then Sweden, Spain, Poland. So I think we're beginning to see the adoption of HSCT as a treatment for uh, MS uh, across the European landscape, dominated uh, by certain countries at the moment. Um, but I suspect uh, with, uh, these should really be uh, corrected for the background population. So I, I, I would imagine overall um, we're beginning to gradually see the increased use of it. <clears throat> Now, one of the things um, I've been actively involved in is a policy initiative to try and drive early intervention uh, to improve outcome. We have incredibly good data now showing you that delayed access to disease-modifying therapy impacts on your long-term outcome. And so we launched a policy initiative uh, back in 2018. Uh, it, would, it was basically time matters in MS. And I think what the message has got through now, most people in the field accept that we shouldn't delay access to disease modifying therapy. The sooner you get on it, the better you do. Um, what has emerged uh, since that policy document is that there's now overwhelming evidence that people who go on to high efficacy, the more effective treatments first, do better. And this is just uh, data from an uh, international database called MS Base. Uh, and showing you that people who access uh, high efficacy therapies late do worse than those getting it early. Um, uh, and I think the bottom curve um, is very informative because the, when you when you receive the therapy, this is six years from disease onset, um, the differences are smaller, implying that it's not only just about early access, but it's very early access to high efficacy therapies. Uh, maximize your chances of doing well. And that's why we're now um, developing our second campaign, which is not just about early treatment, but about early high efficacy therapies. Uh, we call this flipping the pyramid. In other words, starting on the most effective therapies. Now, I'm not saying everybody should go into high efficacy therapy. I'm just saying that everybody should understand that if you do go into high efficacy therapy, on average, you do better. And people, I think we have enough data now from clinical trials and from real world evidence that people should be given the option uh, at baseline, you know, when they're first diagnosed, um, to, be, to be treated with a high efficacy therapy. They should have that choice. <clears throat> and uh, some people will choose it, uh, others won't because they may be risk averse, but it's the choice that's important. A lot of clinicians, a lot of MS centers don't give people that choice. They make the decision for them, and I think that's wrong. And so the whole 
purpose of our uh, treatment strategy now is to try and drive uh, the MS community to manage MS hyperactively. In other words, like we manage stroke. Now we know in stroke patients, when you block an artery and you have an area of the brain that has got no blood supply, uh, seconds and minutes counts. I mean, we think in MS, maybe days, weeks, months count. Uh, and that's the whole premise of our international uh, policy around uh, uh, brain health time matters is to try and speed up the pathways uh, underlying the treatment of MS. How do we get people referred in early, diagnosed early, onto treatment early, monitor if they break through, escalate their treatment? All these things are really important. And we have got a whole lot of initiatives to try, to try and uh, drive the adoption of this new uh, treatment policy. We're taking it one step forward, and my colleague, Professor Klaus Schmera, is the lead investigator on this trial, where we're taking people with their first clinical event, be it optic neuritis, a brainstem or spinal cord attack, and we're randomizing them to starting nadalizumab within two weeks of their first symptoms. And in the other arm, people will be delayed and only start the treatment at week 12, which is kind of what normally happens now. It takes about three months to complete the diagnostic workup and get people onto a treatment. And we want to know if starting one of our most effective therapies, natalizumab, uh, very early, say 10 to 12 weeks earlier than what we would normally start, it makes a difference. And if this trial is positive, okay, in terms of it's going to completely change the treatment landscape because then we will have data to, to tell clinicians, goodness me, you can't just uh, sit on your hands and wait. You have to treat MS as soon as possible to maximize outcomes. That's what it's about. It's about driving the adoption of a rapid active treatment approach for MS. This trial is now open. That's running in London, and we uh, hope that our colleagues will refer patients into this trial. because I think it's a really important study testing a therapeutic strategy uh, that may make a big difference to MS outcomes in the future. One of the things we do know is that the older you get, the response to treatments drops off. And so this is a meta-analysis. Each dot here represents a different clinical trial. And the underlying message is once you get above 50, these treatments uh, are really not that effective in, in terms of disability progression, which is driven mainly by lower limb function. I think the interpretation of this would change if we included uh, upper limb and uh, swallowing and cognition, for example. So I'm not saying this is a, uh, uh, the message is that these treatments don't work in older people. These treatments are less effective, particularly in, in people with more advanced disease who've already lost a lot of the nerves to their lower limbs. Um, uh, <clears throat> but the important message is, is that age plays a role. So, you know, if you are wanting to access a highly effective treatment, you should do it early. Now, one of the uh, biological reasons for responding to a treatment is recovery of function. And the older you get, the less likely you are to recover function. And that's because recovery mechanisms uh, are age dependent. And we know this not only from MS, but from stroke, spinal cord injury. The younger you are when you have those events, the more likely you are to have a good recovery. And this is actually on the right here, a uh, data from a trial, uh, Vexaritine is an agent, it's a remyelinating agent. Uh, the overall trial was negative, but when you actually um, uh, looked at age, you can see people below the age of about 43, 41, 42 year, were much more likely to respond to the treatment. This is looking at the speed of conduction in the optic nerve uh, in people that had optic neuritis in the past. And the younger people responded to the treatment and the older people didn't. Overall, the trial was negative, but this is another message here, is maybe we should be more selective in our recruitment for these trials and only put younger people in the trial so we can get a positive result. Okay. So the message I'm saying, though, is if you want to benefit from HACT, you're much better off getting it early when you're young, then later when you have less chance of responding to the therapy, less chance of recovery of function. And so this is a recent paper, uh, and Professor Basil Sharrick from Sheffield is the lead author on this. And they went all over the world and found 20 patients with MS who received HSCT first line. So of, of that thousands of patients in that graph in the European registry, very few patients receive this uh, first line. But I think the important message here is looking at 
the, uh, uh, EDSS score improvement and all but one patient noticed a dramatic improvement uh, in the EDSS scores you know so and you can see the curves here you know how well these patients responded so I know this is only 20 patients with MS getting at first line but they seem to re 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 respond dramatically and so the question is should we be using this agent this treatment strategy first line but at least have it on the table as an offering to people with more active or more um, uh, poor prognostic profile as a first line treatment and i'd argue yes now people criticize me for using the term cure but based on what we think ms is hact and the other group treatments in this class which we call the immune reconstitution therapies okay may offer uh, people a cure in other words they flatline them after treatment um, we probably need to define what we mean by a cure so we can look for it and the question is are a certain proportion of patients having hsct having alemtuzumab having oral cladribine are they cured and you know we put forward a working definition that if people are neither at, at 15 years they, they're likely to be cured and uh, we are seeing a small number of people getting to that time point after these uh, more aggressive therapies uh, these immune reconstitution therapies fulfilling this definition and i suppose we're probably going to need to go to 25 40 and 50 years to be to be confident but i think we are seeing a significant proportion of patients uh, free of activity at 15 years which is telling us that this, these treatments are really effective <clears throat> adding the normal brain volume uh, changes and we're asking and we're saying to people goodness me you know if you want to give yourself the maximum chance of doing well uh, you know shouldn't you consider having one of these most effective therapies first line i would so who decides uh, and so this is a quote uh, and this is a real experience i had about five or six years ago from a colleague of mine who works in another center and he said i don't offer my patients with alemtuzumab or uh, MS, alemtuzumab, or HSCT, it is simply too risky, particularly as we now have so many other safer treatment options. So in other words, he doesn't even have it on the table. He just made a decision for his patients not to offer these two treatments. My response to him was too risky for whom? Yourself or the patient? Are you aware that both of these treatments, alemtuzumab and HSCT, are nice and NHS England approved therapies to treat MS? Uh, and so I feel quite strongly about this. Uh, NICE was uh, uh, became became an uh, institution based on an act of parliament, and the ruling is that if you are NICE approved, you should uh, there should be a legal obligation to offer patients who are eligible the treatment. So I suspect we're going to see a legal case where somebody who's not offered these treatments does badly sues that particular neurologist or uh, NHS institution and I suspect they may win the case because under the uh, law uh, nice approved therapies should be on the table if you're eligible for them so this attitude is just ridiculous you can't do it and it got so bad that one of my colleagues who uh, works in the southwest of England was actually accused as having gabinitis implying me for wanting to put one of his patients on alemtuzumab first line I think this is such a flippant comment because this is not about me or about it it's about a therapy therapy for a patient who's got bad ms you know so i don't uh, think we should uh, uh, make comments like this because at the end of the day we're playing with people's lives you know this is about treating their disease and if they want uh, uh, highly effective therapies first line and if they want hsc 2 alemtuzumab first line you know we need to uh, uh, offer it to them if they're eligible <clears throat> anyway just to say to you that on average and I'm saying across the UK and possibly across the world most neurologists think that alemtuzumab and HSCT is more risky the, the risks associated with it are outweigh the benefits of the treatment whereas they think the other DMTs it's the other way around the benefits outweigh the risks which is why they're more likely to prescribe other therapies rather than the most effective treatments uh, to, to manage MS. One of the things I think is missing in this is the actual risk of MS uh, and a lot of the time these decisions are made without telling people uh, what the risks of MS are and uh, MS is a potentially devastating disease uh, be it untreated or even under treated MS 
that impacts on quality of life. There's a reduced life expectancy, a higher suicide risk. Um, you know, the scary thing is about half the population of people with MS are unemployed about 10 years into their disease when they're not physically disabled. I mean, this is a real uh, problem. You know, this is driven almost certainly by hidden symptoms, fatigue and cognitive impairment. But, you know, if I had MS and I was going to be told I've got a 50% chance of being able to work in 10 years' time, of course I'm going to take uh, uh, the, the risk of a more effective treatment up front. We don't tell our patients this. Uh, relationships, people with MS are much more likely to split up from their partners or get divorced. And there's also all the costs associated with it. So clearly, um, being able to target this disease early and effectively it makes complete sense when you think about the prognosis of MS uh, in the future. But anyway, who am, I to, who am I to say? But I would really argue that you can't have a risk-benefit discussion without being blunt, okay, uh, and not pulling your punches or talking through rose or looking through rose-tinted glasses. You've got to tell people about the potential impact MS can have on their lives. And then I think more and more people with multiple sclerosis will be convinced they want the most effective therapies first line. Now, this could... Uh, this study, which is from Germany from over 10 years ago, um, was done when there was this big scare around natalizumab and the risk of the PML, the progressive multifocal leukemia encephalopathy, the CNS infection that happens with this treatment. And one of the things is is that um, um, when it came to risk, 80% of people with, with multiple sclerosis would accept a risk higher than 1 in 5,000 um, uh, of getting PML. Okay. Uh, whereas only 50% of physicians would stop at this event rate. So the uh, message here is that neurologists, clinicians, are much more risk averse than people with the disease. Okay. <clears throat> uh, similarly, from the same group, who should decide? Okay. And you can see the physician should decide alone. Almost 0% of people in multiple sclerosis in this survey wanted their clinicians to decide alone. Okay. Most people wanted to make the decision with their physician, okay, or decide on their own. So I think there's another disconnect here. Uh, contrary to what we as healthcare professionals think, people with multiple sclerosis want to be actively engaged in deciding what treatment to go on with some help, with some help. Okay, so who are we not to tell them about what therapies they're eligible for? Anyway, as you know, I do quite a lot of social media, and uh, this is a survey we did on our MS blog seven years ago where we actually were asking this question about hemopoietic stem cell transplant. Should it be offered as a treatment for MS? And almost 100% of people with the disease who responded to this survey uh, said yes. Are neurologists too conservative in their approach to treat MS by not offering HSCT as a routine option? Again, 84% of respondents said yes, 16.1 said no. Now, this is a blinded, anonymous survey, so the people who are saying no, yeah, could have been healthcare professionals responding to this. You know, we just got to trust that they're people with the disease. But anyway, the message here is the majority of people who responded to the survey think the MS community from a healthcare professional perspective are too conservative. If you had highly active MS and wanted an induction type therapy, would you choose HACT over alemtuzumab treatment? And yes, so uh, of the respondents, you know, three quarters would rather have HACT than alemtuzumab. Now that's a really interesting one. So um, this is a, they would rather have the more effective treatment, HACT than alemtuzumab. I suspect it's because the risk profile of those two treatments are relatively similar. What level of risk of dying from a treatment are you willing to take? Uh, and this is really, really interesting. Almost 60% of people, okay, we're going to take a, a risk of above uh, 0.5, 1 in 200. Okay. So they were prepared to take a risk of 1 in 200 uh, or higher. Even some people were prepared to take a risk of 1 in 20 of dying to have uh, HACT. So this is actually was to me the most shocking or surprising uh, outcome of this particular survey. <clears throat> HACT as a treatment for active MS should be freely available in the NHS. 97% uh, said yes and it is available. I mean this is contrary to what people think. HACT is nice approved and it's available across uh, the UK. 
in all of their home countries. So it's not a question of it not being available. It's there. It's a question of the patients not being referred for it. Okay, not being referred for it. <clears throat> HSC is a treatment for active MS should be a first line option, and uh, yes, so uh, almost 90%, 87% of respondents think that should be a first line option. So this is a real eye opener: is that the MS community think we should have HSCT on the table as a first line therapy, and who should take the risks? And this is a, uh, a really important outcome of the survey: was the majority, almost 90%, said the person with MS patient should take the risk. Um, some people thought the healthcare professional should take the risk, but I think the overwhelming message is, yes, when it comes to risks, it's not for the, H the healthcare professional uh, to take the risk. It's the person with the disease, which means we have to become more uh, educated and better at explaining risks uh, because it's quite difficult to explain risks. And the way the healthcare professional frames that debate Okay, can actually sh uh, sway an individual's person's uh, mind whether or not to go for one treatment or another. So it's also about how do we do it in a way that's not full of our own biases. Uh, how do we explain risk in a passive, neutral way so people with MS can come to their own conclusion about what level of risk they're prepared to take in terms of treating the MS. Now, there are a lot of stakeholders when it comes to HSCT. So obviously, there's the payers, be it the NHS or insurance, pharmaceutical industry have vested interests. They don't want us to treat people with HACT because it's a procedure. It's not putting patients onto uh, drugs. So pharma companies often frame the debate uh, as this is the most toxic, severe, risky therapy. Instead of having that, have our therapy. And they've got, they obviously got a conflict of interest because they want you to go onto their drug forever uh, and cost more. Obviously, the regulators, my personal opinion, the regulators are, are pretty risk averse and they're unlikely to uh, approve HSCT um, you know, based on the risk profile. Neurologists, which are also risk averse, there's the hematologists, um, you know, they've run bone marrow transplant units and they don't have capacity issues, so they're li less likely to prioritize autoimmune disease like MS. Patients, healthcare managers, do we have capacity in the units to treat these patients? Are they making sufficient income from it? And obviously the patient organizations are involved. Now, these are these people have all got different opinions. Uh, and so there is no consensus from, the st from all our stakeholders. And this is a problem because unless we get a consensus about HACT as a treatment for MS and as HACT as a first-line treatment for MS, we're going to go nowhere. So there is a... A mechanism of trying to get consensus and uh, it's called a citizen's jury and I was taken to uh, task uh, on the uh, on our blog uh, because I went out there and said if I had MS based on the data of course I'd want to be treated with HACT first line you know why wouldn't you based on what you've just seen and I would take the risk because I know how damaging MS can be in the long term um, but the problem is I don't refer patients for HACT first line. The reason why I can't refer them for uh, HACT because under our treatment guidelines in England, it's the third line therapy. So yes, we do refer patients for HACT, but they have to have failed other treatments. And that's, uh, I'm not in charge of the committee that put these uh, guidelines in place. So I can't refer anybody or any patient of mine uh, and, th and that's why we're doing a clinical trial at the moment that's called the star ms trial where people with uh, rapidly evolving severe very active ms uh, can be referred for uh, screening for the trial and they can get randomized to hsct or one of the other high efficacy therapies so yes although i'm promoting hsct as a first line therapy i am handcuffed i can't refer because our guidelines don't allow it Okay, so we have to, I have to work within the restrictions of our guidelines. One of the ways you can solve uh, a problem when all these stakeholders have different opinions and different vested interests is actually take the decision away from them and you put in place what we call a citizen's jury. And this is, uh, I would recommend you go to the Center for a New Democratic Process. They talk about the process of how you get a citizen's journey. So you define the challenge. The challenge here is should we offer at a NHS level HSCT first line? You design a process uh, and you invite a community. Now, the community is really, really important. You go to the general population, non-experts, 
Okay, these don't have to be doctors, don't have to be people with MS. Actually, they have to be outside of the of the uh, uh, stakeholders. They've got to be people independent of the stakeholders. You select participants and then you educate them. You go through all the issues. So what I'm doing now in this presentation, we would go into more detail in this presentation and explain to them what we're trying to do. And then they uh, will have a facilit somebody facilitate them and they will have a debate and discuss things and then they will uh, uh, create recommendations and then you uh, impact on it. Then they, you amplify and share those recommendations. The important thing though is if you put a citizen's jury in place, all those stakeholders, uh, these stakeholders, have to sign up to a citizen's jury and the principal and then implement what the citizen's jury put out. And this is a very effective way of solving complex problems. And on the website, uh, on the Center for New Democratic Processes website, there's examples of how citizens juries have helped resolve complex issues. Okay. Uh, and this is a new type of democracy, and I think it should be, uh, um, I think it should be taken forward. And uh, when I did my, that blog post, I did a survey and asked, would you support a citizen's jury? And I was uh, reassured when I explained it to the community, I explained the position I was in, that, that we got 86% uh, of respondents uh, for this survey saying, yes, they would uh, support a citizen's jury to try and sort out this uh, problem. It is important because, you know, I work in an NHS where the founding principles are equity. Everybody should have equal access to treatments and it's free of point of care and so clearly HACT is free at point of care because the NHS will pay for it if you fulfill the, fulfill the criteria and are you selected but it's not uh, freely available okay uh, it's not freely available so <clears throat> uh, you can actually um, get this therapy if you're prepared to pay for it in the private sector or go abroad, okay? Um, I just want to put off my uh, notifications. Uh, now, one of the problems we have in the MS space is the ado adoption of innovations. Uh, and I would say when it comes to HACT, we've had some innovators. Uh, who've actually pioneered testing this in MS. And we've got some early adopters. Uh, so we're one of the centers, which I would say are early adopters. We are beginning to uh, use it. But we're far away from the majority uh, or the late adopters uh, 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 using it. There's a small handful of centers in the, in the, in the country that actually uh, offer HACT as a treatment for MS. And so we have to do things to drive the adoption so it becomes available and accessible to everybody in the country. And that's one of the problems we do have postcode prescribing. So, you know, if you come to center X or center Y, you will have an option of being treated with HACT third line. Nobody does it first line at the moment, unless there's some really bad MS. Okay. And that should not be allowed. You know, we should have equitable access so and the, and the only way we can do this is by driving adoption so i wanted to just conclude by saying uh, you know we as neurologists are quite lucky and i have a personal story to say my father uh, had chronic renal failure so he presented when he was 38 or 39 i can never remember exactly how old he was but before he was 40 uh, with malignant high blood pressure malignant hypertension and he was found to be in chronic renal failure uh, and he went on to dialysis about 12 months later. Uh, he first went on to peritoneal, then he had re uh, hemodialysis, and then he had a renal transplant 12 years after that. But when he presented to the, his nephrologist, his kidney doctor, he had end-stage kidney disease. He had lost almost all his kidney function, and his kidneys were scarred and small. And they were shrunken, the equivalent of having a brain volume loss in MS. And his nephrologist said to him, I can't do anything for you now except replace your kidney function with dialysis and if I got to, if you'd come to me earlier because my father had an autoimmune disease of the kidney so the immune system was damaging the kidney I could have done something by you know managing your your, your and and so the, the question here is why wasn't my father seen earlier and actually he was missed he, you know, he had he had several episodes of blood in his urine when he was a teenager and it wasn't taken seriously and so you know maybe he could have been prevented from having renal failure 
Um, so we as neurologists have sentinel events. We get people early, and we should actually think about protecting the end organ. And this is an example from another disease. Now, I can tell you, frankly, that nephrologists, kidney doctors, are some of the most aggressive treaters um, of autoimmune kidney disease to prevent people losing their kidney function and needing dialysis. But they've got a backup option. We don't have any backup option in MS. We have zero backup option for replacing the brain and spinal cord. And I just don't know why we as a neurology community are so conservative. You know, we are dealing with the most precious, I think, the most precious organ, the central, you know, the brain and spinal cord. Surely we should be doing our utmost to protect that so people with MS can get to old age and, you know, try and age normally. Another example is rheumatologists. So this is actually something we don't see anymore. It's a person who's got an end-stage rheumatoid hand. Uh, and you can actually treat a rheumatoid hand by now doing joint replacements. But the rheumatologists were ahead of the curve in terms of uh, how we manage inflammatory diseases. And they are the people that put in place this rapid diagnosis, rapid treatment uh, paradigm and flipping the pyramid. Uh, and so... I would argue that um, uh, we should learn from other diseases. So uh, rheumatology patients, um, uh, you know, uh, are a paradigm to, to copy. Um, and, you know, the, the need for joint replacements in rheumato rheumatoid arthritis has dropped off by about 90%. And that's because the rheumatologists are probably the most aggressive treaters. Rapid diagnosis, rapid treatment, rapid escalation, and flipping the pyramid. And we're trying to adopt those into MS. Um, and again, uh, the rheumatologists have a backup. They can replace joints. You know, we in MS can't do that. And I think we should learn from our colleagues in other areas who have developed these therapeutic strategies. So I concluded uh, at this meeting that, um, you know, we need to ask ourselves as healthcare professionals, you know, are we prepared to gamble with our patients' brains and spinal cord? I think we shouldn't gamble with them. We should clearly uh, put in place proper shared or guided decision-making. We should avoid imposing our cognitive biases and gaslighting them. A lot of people with MS would say they, when they ask about HACT, they're ignored. And we should include uh, 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 autologous hemopoietic stem cell treatment options in all our multidisciplinary team meetings. This patient has highly active disease, having failed, they're rapidly evolving. They are eligible for uh, DMT X, Y, and Z, and they're also eligible for HACT. Go back, go away and discuss it with them. We're not doing that. Most MDTs do not include HACT uh, in their decision making. I think we need to go beyond uh, no inflammatory disease activity. So when we're talking to people about disease modifying therapies, we should also talk to them about the impact of these treatments on brain volume loss and what it means. I think more people, if they understood that this treatment had a moderate impact on brain volume loss, but this treatment had the most, they will, they will choose the treatment that impacts the most on brain volume loss. Uh, I, I also mentioned that we should only... We should also just go beyond MS. You know, there are lots of things we can do in, in terms of outcomes by promoting brain health. And I think we as neurologists or healthcare professionals are in a privileged position. We get people with a sentinel event. They come to us relatively early in the course of their disease. Not at the beginning. Most people will have had MS before they get their first event, but at least they come to you when they've got an organ to protect. And so we should really consider uh, treating this uh, disease more actively. And that is trying to uh, limit the time they're not on treatment, flipping the pyramid. And I also think, you know, we should define an MS cure and look for it. And we shouldn't be scared of using the cure word, the C word. You know, if we told people with MS that alemtuzumab and HACT and cladribine, um, these immune reconstitution therapies that are front-loading risk, um, cure a proportion of patients or potentially cure a proportion of patients, I think that may nudge people uh, towards choosing them. Anyway, a lot of people don't think we should be using that because uh, they don't think we can cure MS, and I would disagree. If MS is an autoimmune disease, we should be able to cure it. And we need as a community to encourage adoption of HACT. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this is research, the STAR-MS trial, which is funded by the NIHR. We clearly need another policy initiative around this. Uh, I think we have to educate, educate, educate. This is not only uh, healthcare professionals, neurologists, but also people with the disease. Uh, we need a, a PR media campaign, and I personally would support starting a citizen's jury. 
I think that would sort out the problem quickly. But to do a citizen's jury, we're going to get have to get buy-in from all the stakeholders because uh, we have to accept the outcome of a citizen's jury. I, and I may be wrong. You know, the citizen's jury may say, no, we don't think uh, it should be offered first line. And that's fine. I will accept the citizen's jury. But, you know, uh, let's have one and let's see if they come up, uh, what, what guidelines they come up with. We may find that a citizen's jury say, yes, HSCT should be available first line, but only for the most active patients, and I'll accept that. Um, uh, and but let's let's go through the process. So I'll stop there, uh, and we'll take questions. I say take questions. <clears throat> um, uh, questions have to be asked, uh, asked on the MSLV website. There's a there's a place there for discussion. And I'll need to nudge you. Um, the more people that subscribe to MSLV, the more chances are it's surviving long term. Um, I'm not using the money for myself. I'm using the money uh, to pay for a medical writer and a web designer to, who who created the MSLFI microsite, which is the curated version of MSLFI. Uh, so when you go to the uh, MSLFI, you know at the moment on the Substack newsletter, you've got to trawl through you know, you know hundreds of previous newsletters to find information. At least the website will curate that. There'll be an index, and you'll find it very, very easy. I think that's going to be a lot, a lot of help, particularly for newly diagnosed patients, to have a curated uh, resource.